wrath of Sajuk will descend upon Karadi in an unimaginable hailstorm of fire and death. Know that you will one day bring this fate upon us all. Three craft on our tails. Enemy in pursuit. Contact detected. Request for the The year is KDS 1216 by the Karakian dating system. Slightly over a hundred years after the success of Operation Kadim and the discovery of the Kar Toba, the crashed spaceship that both served as the first city of Karak millennia prior, as well as proved that the Kushan people were not native to this desert world. In the years following, future expeditions to the Kar Toba site would reveal two artifacts that would change the future of the Kushan forever. The first was the Hyperspace Core, a device that could potentially carry ships great distances across the galaxy in a dramatically short amount of time. A technological find such as this by itself would have been an unprecedented momentous event in the history of any species. But it was the second artifact that perhaps had the greatest effect on the Kushan people. This artifact in question to the casual observer would look like nothing more than a hunk of rock with some carvings on it. But upon further inspection, those carvings would turn out to be a galactic map, which indicated both Karak's position in the galaxy, and another point that was labeled using a single word, Egara, our home. With these discoveries, the infighting between the Kithid, the main societal groups among the Kushan, stopped for the first time in recorded history. For once, the entirety of their people were united in the goals of building the means to travel the stars and find their long-lost home of Vagara. This singular effort, known simply as the Mothership Project, would be the greatest collective effort ever embarked upon by the Kushan. First, a great construction scaffold had to be created in orbit of Karak to facilitate the building of the Mothership herself, a process that in itself alone took over 60 years. Once it was finished, the true work of building their salvation could begin. The plan was for the mothership to use the hyperspace core found at the Kar Toba to traverse the long distances across the galaxy, which was estimated to have a range of up to 2,500 light years in a single trip. However, surviving the journey was another matter. Due to the unknown nature of what waited for them out in the galaxy, the mothership was designed with the ability to create other spacecraft based on whatever need would arise. In that regard, her production capabilities ranged from building resource collectors and strike craft, all the way up to, at the time, theoretical super capital ship class. By KDS 1216, Karak and the surrounding asteroids had been mined bare for precious metals and resources to build the ship that would ferry over 600,000 Kushan to Hagara, along with a command staff, crew, and assorted personnel to keep the mothership and her fleet maintained. But one last problem presented itself in the design of the mothership that no one expected. Due to the size of the ship, and the amounts of data that needed to be properly analyzed, it was projected that a command crew in the hundreds was deemed necessary for basic operations. However, this in itself created a much bigger problem, as essentially more people in the command staff would drastically slow down the speed of communicating critical information, and make quick decision making all but impossible, especially in a combat situation. Computers of the time were of no help, as even they did not have the processing power to overcome this logistical nightmare. Seemingly, no solution to this dilemma could be found until a young neuroscientist named Karen Sajet proposed an unorthodox solution. Karen's proposal was that, using her neuronics research, a person could be connected directly into the data feeds of the mothership herself, and be able to draw conclusions and issue orders without the need for a complicated command hierarchy to slow things down. Unfortunately, this procedure to directly interface a living being with a ship was highly experimental, and there was no guarantee that it would work in the first place, nor could any assurances be placed that the same person could be removed from the ship once the mission was complete. Faced with no alternative to the logistics problem, and the danger presented by the operation needed to interface a living being with a mothership, Karen demanded that she be the one to undergo the procedure, which she did. 
When she was joined with the mothership, she became something far greater than just Karen Sajet. She had ascended to the role and title of Fleet Command. With the mothership completed at last, the first thing that needed to be tested was the hyperspace core, by plotting a quick jump to the edge of the Karak system. There, a sublight vessel that was launched ten years prior, the Kar Salim, would rendezvous with them and perform any repairs and refinements of the mothership and her hyperspace calculations respectively. But once Fleet Command gave the order to initiate the hyperspace core, no Kushan alive at the time could have anticipated that this would be the exact moment where their existence as a people would change forever. Exiting at the outer rim of the system as planned, everything aboard the mothership appeared to be in working order. However, there was no sign of the Kar Salim. A quick reconnoiter by the Kushan strike craft eventually found the ship, or at least her forward section, the only part of the Kar Salim left intact. Moving quickly, a salvage operation was ordered to bring back the Kar Salim's black box to determine what had happened. But as the fleet moved closer to the derelict, several alien strike craft emerged from hiding and moved to attack the Kushan ships. Shocked, but determined to find the answers they needed, the Kushan struck back with their burgeoning fleet and defeated these alien raiders. Poring over the data from the Kar Salim, it was revealed that in her last moments, the bridge crew had detected an incoming hyperspace signature that was not from the mothership, but was instead from the same aliens the Kushan fleet had recently fought. It was unknown as to why these raiders chose to attack the Karak system, much less do it now. But whatever the reason for their timing, Karak needed to be warned of this new threat, and a hyperspace course was quickly plotted back to the scaffold. But it was already too late. Coming out of hyperspace, there was no scaffold, no supporting vessels, no Karak. Instead, debris surrounded the fleet, and the burning remnants of their home planet was all that remained. The emotional impact felt by every Kushan aboard the mothership in that moment could not be possibly described with any means of accuracy. In a brief span of time on what was supposed to be a simple shakedown cruise, their entire civilization had been reduced to a smoldering ruin, leaving those aboard the gargantuan ship as the last survivors of the glorious Kushan race. Or so they thought. Mothership sensors soon picked up a faint distress call coming from the cryo trays in orbit of Karak. They were under attack by yet another unknown alien race. Most likely, there were stragglers left behind by those responsible for the devastation of Karak to deal with any survivors. These cryo trays were now perhaps the most important thing left in the system, as they contained over 600,000 Kushan colonists held in cryogenic suspension, awaiting loading and transport by the mothership to their long lost homeworld of Hagara. But as a safety precaution, they were left behind in orbit before the hyperspace test, so as to not needlessly jeopardize their lives. But now it seemed these frozen colonists would face certain death if Fleet Command did not intervene. Rushing quickly, Kushan strike craft intercepted the alien frigates attacking the last of their people. However, Fleet Intelligence cautioned their pilots to hold back their desire for revenge, and ordered them to leave one frigate to be captured and brought back to the mothership. If anyone could answer the multitude of questions behind recent events, it would be the crew of one of these attacking ships. Following their orders to the letter, the Kushan pilots crushed the invaders before they could finish their attempted genocide. All except for one frigate, of course, that was quickly commandeered by the salvage corvettes and brought back to the mothership for interrogation. May Sajuk have mercy on their souls, for the Kushan would spare none. After an indeterminate amount of time, the interrogations were finished, with the alien crew mysteriously not surviving the process. Regardless, a wealth of information was uncovered as to the assault on Karak. The ones who perpetrated this attack on their world were the Taidani, who were the leaders of a massive interstellar government known as the Taidan Empire. Over 4,000 years ago, the Kushan themselves, apparently, had entered into an agreement with the Taidani that prevented them from developing hyperspace technology for unexplained reasons. When the mothership conducted its first hyperspace test, the energy emissions were detected by the Outer Rim Taidan fleet, and under direct orders from their emperor, were sent to Karak to wipe out the planet with an atmosphere deprivation weapon as punishment for violating the agreement. This revelation was stunning. The Kushan people were nearly exterminated over an agreement no known living being ever remembered, besides the Taidani. There was nothing left for them now. 
but the Kushan exiles could not stay here among the ashes of their world and simply die. The only course of action left to Fleet Command and the Mothership crew was to continue with the mission, return to Higara, but not before they took their revenge on the Taidan fleet that destroyed Karak. The dead world behind them deserved no less. However, the fleet needed to build up their forces for the arduous battles ahead of them. With this in mind, Fleet Command ordered a hyperspace course be plotted to a mineral-rich asteroid field in an area known as the Great Wastelands. There, the Kushans could harvest the raw materials needed to bolster and support their fleet and operations. But during the course of extracting the raw materials they needed, yet another new alien ship chose to reveal itself to the Kushan. This time, however, it was friendly. The vessel in question was a Bentuzi exchange ship, who wished to establish relations with the new exiles for the purposes of trade. At this particular moment in time, the Bentuzi were keen to trade the scientific knowledge to create ion cannons, in exchange for a certain portion of the resources they were harvesting. Fleet Command accepted. Such a powerful offensive technology would be nothing but a boon when the fleet would finally take the fight to the Taidani. But the Bentuzi needed to keep this new relationship secret, and withdrew quickly once the deal was finished. The Tyrannic Raiders, allies of the Taidani, and the same race who attacked the Kar Salim, were on an intercept course with the Kushan mothership, but with their fleet armed with the new ion cannons, the Kushan made short work of the Tyrannics. The stage was now set for the showdown between the Kushan exiles and the Taidani Outer Rim fleet. After a quick pause to repair damage from the battle with the Tyrannics, the Kushans jumped further into the Great Wastelands to where fleet intelligence estimated the Taidan forces were. They were correct. Once battle was joined, the Kushan hit the Taidani navy with the unyielding fury of their people. No Taidan ship was spared. Any time a Kushan was lost in battle, the others fought all the harder with their endless determination. Inevitably, the space surrounding them became filled with the broken metal carcasses of their enemies. The Kushan had triumphed. As the last of the Taidani fleet wreckage spread out into the endless realms of space, the Kushan took stock. Killing the people directly responsible for the burning of Karak would not bring their loved ones back, but at least the ghosts of their people could at least find some peace. But the journey was just beginning, and the distance to Hegara, their original homeworld, was still vast, and there was still the issue of the Taidani and their emperor. With the destruction of their fleet, the Kushan had now proven themselves a threat, and the Taidan Empire could not simply ignore their existence now. The Homeworld War had just begun. Dan Empire had fortified their galactic holdings well. Kushan analysts aboard the mothership had finally decrypted the data from the Taidani frigate they captured after the burning of Karak. Amongst their findings was a recording of an Imperial broadcast extolling the power of their military through the defenses set up along the Outer Rim, that consisted of heavily fortified space stations and Imperial fleets meant to interdict any ship passing through. Kushan fleet intelligence concluded that getting themselves tangled in an assault on any one of these positions along their journey to Hagara was a foolhardy idea. Fortunately, however, the spiral galaxy itself seemingly provided a natural solution to their dilemma. An alternate route was discovered that would take the fleet through an active asteroid field, and then past a large nebula that would conveniently hide themselves from the baleful gaze of the Taidan Empire. The nebula also seemed to have no Taidani military presence, thus making it an ideal passageway into the inner rim of the galaxy. Faced with no other option to continue their journey, Karen Sajet as Fleet Command committed the exiles to this new plan, and their ships began preparations to depart. 
The first leg of their journey, the asteroid field, did not prove much of a challenge for the fleet of exiles. Despite a miscalculated hyperspace jump that caused the mothership and her cohorts to emerge among the asteroids and not pass them. But since the loss of Karak, the Kushan strike craft had become very effective at point defense, annihilating any of the space debris that threatened the mothership and her precious cargo of surviving Kushans held in cryogenic suspension. And eventually, the asteroid field and the danger it presented passed them by. As the fleet was taking stock after their inadvertent trip through the asteroids, a Bentuzi exchange ship emerged from hyperspace near their position. As always, they came to trade technology with the Kushan in exchange for a certain quantity of their resources. Fleet Command, always eager to gain access to anything that could give them the edge against their enemies, readily agreed. But as they concluded their deal, Karen Sajet asked the Bentuzi if they knew anything about the Great Nebula they were to cross. Cryptically, the Bentuzi warned that they heard nothing there, and that no one returns. They then finished by stating that even the Tai Dani were afraid to enter the nebula, which explained the lack of their presence inside what was an obvious gap in their defensive lines. The two races would then depart, with the Kushan continuing their hyperspace course into the nebula and the Bentuzi leaving for parts unknown. Despite the mysterious warning, the nebula was still their best chance of getting past the Tai Dan military. But all the while, Karen Sajet continued to ponder what the enigmatic race said about no one returning from the nebula. What could possibly be dangerous enough to cause a race such as them to actively avoid the region of space her fleet was about to enter? For better or worse, the Kushans would find the answer to this question. Coming out of hyperspace inside the nebula, fleet intelligence noted that the area surrounding them was rich in resources they could use to augment and bolster their fleet. But the energy levels inside this nebula were so high that it affected the sensors of every ship in the fleet, providing a convenient way to effectively ambush the Kushans if someone wished to do so. But the riches of the nebula were too tempting, and Fleet Command ordered harvesting operations to begin immediately. They would take what they could before continuing their journey out of the nebula. However, there was something hiding out in the gases that was watching them and which also took offense to the Exile's blatant exploitation of their nebula. Not long into the fleet's resourcing operations, an unknown mothership-sized vessel emerged from seemingly nowhere and was on an intercept course with the fleet of Exiles. Per standard procedure for the Kushans, they sent out a lone ambassador ship to greet the strange visitor. The new ship, in turn, also proceeded to do the same by sending out a strike craft-sized ship. Once both representatives met, the unknown visitor immediately explained that this nebula they were in was the Garden of Kadesh. For 13 generations, they protected it from trespassers and those that would defile the nebula. The Kadeshi diplomat then gave them two choices, join them in the garden or die. The Kushan ambassador, maintaining his composure, replied that they did not know the significance of this place and that his people meant no conflict. And once the mothership hyperspace module was fully charged again, they would leave without further provocation. But this was not good enough for the Kadeshi. If the Kushan would not join them, the only option was death. For in the words of the Kadeshi ambassador, no one withdraws from the garden. Following these failed attempts at negotiations, both ambassadors withdrew back to their respective motherships. But the Kadeshi, true to their threats, began deploying their own strike craft en masse, the Swarmers. And in a frightening amount of time, the number of Kadeshi craft seemed to almost block out the light from the nebula. Making matters worse, the Kadeshi mothership was emitting a hyperspace inhibitor field that would prevent the Kushans from escaping, even once their own hyperspace module was fully charged. Strangely, it was quickly noticed by Kushan analysts that this technology they used was almost identical to their own. But there was little time to dwell on this, as the approaching Kadeshi left the exiles with only two options, fight or be destroyed. Throwing themselves headfirst into the Kadeshi, the Kushan ships fought with a zeal that easily rivaled the numbers of their enemies. But slowly, the tide of battle began turning against them. For every swarmer that was destroyed, two more seemed to take their place, and the Kushan mothership could not replace their losses so quickly. 
but a glimmer of hope was discovered amongst the Kadeshi swarms. Their strike craft could not match the range or operational flight time of their own Kushan equivalents, and thus needed mobile fuel pods to keep their ships operational mid-battle. If these fuel pod ships were destroyed, more and more of the Kadeshi swarmers would be rendered out of action as the slugging match between the two fleets wore on. Capitalizing on this, Fleet Command ordered their forces to prioritize the Kadeshi fuel ships, which the Kushan strike craft happily obliged, inevitably destroying their ponderous targets. But the Kadeshi continued to fight on and overwhelm the Kushan fleet. However, little by little during the fighting, the seemingly unending clouds of swarmers began to thin and eventually dissipate entirely. The plan had worked leaving the Kadeshi mothership unguarded from the bloody Kushan warriors eager to put this meat grinder of a battle behind them and leave this nebula at last. It did not take long for the Kadeshi mothership to realize that they would face certain death if they stayed here with the Kushans and began preparations to hyperspace out of the area. The, the exiles had triumphed. After a brief pause to resume their resourcing operations and repair and refit the fleet, the mothership began setting a course out of the nebula ready to emerge into the galaxy outside of this so-called Garden of Kadesh. But when they came out of hyperspace yet again, Fleet Command and Intelligence quickly realized that they were still in the nebula. The same hyperspace inhibitor technology used against them previously was being utilized yet again to pull them out of hyperspace by another Kadeshi mothership detected nearby. Again, a representative from the Kadeshi was sent to make overtures for peace stating that the Kushans could still live among them in the garden. Karen Sajet, deciding to take a direct hand in diplomacy, replied that they could not stay, as they were on a journey to find their home. But she implored the Kadeshi that there could still be peace between their two peoples. She then shared the revelation discovered by the Kushans in the battle prior, that their hyperspace technology was similar to their own and that perhaps they were long-lost brothers and sisters who once shared the same homeworld. The Kadeshi merely replied that they would fail, and that the evil that drove them here to find refuge would destroy the Kushans without challenge, and when that evil would finish with them, they would uncover the existence of the Kadeshi and do the same to their people. If they were to survive, their only option was to destroy the Kushan and prevent them from leaving the nebula. To accentuate this point, fleet intelligence immediately reported that multiple enemy units were closing in on their position, including two more Kadeshi motherships making the odds 3 to 1 against them. Any notion of peace between the two star-faring races had apparently evaporated into the nebular gases that surrounded them. Again, despite their overwhelming swarms, the Kushan fleet was able to turn the tables on the Kadeshi strike craft, eventually destroying two of their motherships. The last survivor, realizing the tide had turned, began retreating with its forces deeper into the nebula for a desperate last stand. But there, unknown to the Kushans, a whole new mystery was to reveal itself. As the Kushan mothership was tracking the movements of the Kadeshi survivors, their sensors began detecting a friendly signature similar to the ones emitted by their own Kushan fleet. And yet, they had no ships operating in that area. Regardless, the Kushans rallied for a final push and began advancing towards the fleeing Kadeshi. But as the fleet closed in on them, the reason why the Kushan mothership had detected a friendly signature in this part of space was answered. The signal was coming from the Kar Toba. But obviously, that couldn't be the case. The Kar Toba, the transport ship that carried the Kushans during the first exodus millennia ago, was destroyed along with the rest of Karak. This derelict ship the Kadeshi were basing their final stand around must have been traveling with their Kartoba at some point during the first exile from the homeworld. Of course, this mystery would have to wait, as the last remnants of the Kadeshi fleet stood defiant against the Kushan ships approaching them, still fully intent on burying the exiles in their garden. From the smallest strike craft to the largest super capital ship, the Kushans tore through the Kadeshi, their eagerness to end this trial in the nebula being reflected in the ferocity of their war-fighting abilities against the Gardeners of Kadesh. And with the hard-won experience the Exiles had gained in fighting with the Kadeshi before, the last of their warriors could no longer hope to stave off the certainty of their own destruction. And in a short but furious battle, the Gardeners of Kadesh were finally broken.
as the debris of the Kadeshi swarms began floating back into the garden they once worshipped. The mothership and her fleet began preparations to hyperspace out of the nebula, but not before they did a thorough analysis of this new Kartoba. And the results they found were astounding. The still intact data banks indicated that for unknown reasons, this ship parted ways with the original Kartoba to take refuge inside the nebula, which their data banks called Kadesh. These exiles survived by scavenging from their ship and harvesting the nebula to sustain their existence. But even this would quickly prove to not be enough. As such, the Kadeshi began resorting to pirating supply ships that would travel through the nebula. Any sense of fair play or mercy was quickly abolished by these new raiders, who remembered their treatment by the galactic community during the exile from Megara. Each captured ship made the Kadeshi stronger, allowing them to take on bigger and more lucrative targets passing through the nebula. All the while, not one being in the galaxy had the faintest idea who these new attackers were, not even the Bentuzi. But as the Kadeshi raids grew in aggression, the Tai Dan Empire, unable to stop these attacks, eventually outlawed their ships from passing through the nebula entirely, with the other galactic powers adopting similar policies, as the risk had far since outweighed the reward. But the Kadeshi were now faced with a crisis. Without a steady supply of new ships to prey on, they began turning inward towards the nebula, harvesting what they could at great cost. They began forming what came to be the modern Kadeshi fleet. Three mothership-sized vessels called home ships were constructed to house their people, along with countless hordes of strike craft to safeguard them. Of course, there were always still ship captains who favored themselves bold enough to cross the nebula, regardless of the stories. And every one of them would learn to regret their decision when a Kadeshi ship would inevitably intercept their vessels and present an impossible choice. Join them or die. Eventually, this modus operandi of the Kadeshi began taking on religious tones as over the long years history became myth. There were no longer raiders trying to survive in hiding, but gardeners tending to the great nebula while punishing those who would dare trespass in this holy place. The findings from this other Kartoba were shocking to the Kushans. All this time they had been fighting their wayward brothers and sisters from Hagara separated by millennia and by the expanse of space. But once again, there would be time to ponder these revelations later. Higara was out there somewhere in the inner rim, and the exile's journey was still far from over. While they had successfully bypassed the Taidan defenses, the Kushans were now very much inside the heart of the Taidan Empire. No one would be able to predict what deadly surprises the mad Emperor Reese II IV II would unleash on the Exile's fleet to prevent them from finding Higara. The Homeworld War was beginning to escalate. The Kushan fleet had succeeded in penetrating the inner rim of the galaxy. The exiles would now have to fight the Taidan Empire in their own territory. However, the Imperial defensive lines guarding their space were still too strong for the Kushans to challenge directly. But no fortification was impenetrable, and often contained a weakness that could be exploited by a cunning enemy. This weakness came in the form of an area of space inhabited by a single Tidani research station studying a supernova. The harmful radiation emitted from the dying star discouraged large assemblages, so the station was only lightly protected by a small defense fleet. But in a stroke of luck for the Kushans, dust clouds that led to the station could protect their ships from the supernova's effects and the Tidan sensors until they got in weapons range of the research station. But the Tai Dan fleet were well aware of this obvious blind, and made sure to mine the clouds to discourage any intruders from interfering with their operations. But that was not all. 
In addition to a small fleet consisting of a carrier, strike craft, and a collection of destroyers, this would be where the fleet of exiles would meet the most powerful ship in the Tidani arsenal, the Quar Jet Heavy Cruiser. Bigger, tougher, and more heavily armed than anything else in their navy, this super capital ship was more than an effective guard dog to keep out trespassers. But this beast had never faced a group as tenacious or capable as the Kushans before. Taking a slow but steady pace through a dust cloud, the Kushan fleet cleared out the mines and stopped cold any ship that tried to escape and warned the station. When the fleet did finally come out of the dust, the station and its guards were caught completely unawares. In a short but furious battle, the Kushans ripped apart the Tidani defenders. Even the Quar jet struggled to overcome the wrath of the exiles until even it, too, fell. The way was now open to continue their journey into the galactic core. But before the exiles could move on, the research station itself was a treasure trove of information about Tidan tactical data and the means to access their communications networks. It was perhaps this access that allowed for fleet intelligence to intercept a transmission from Tidan Emperor Ristu IV II, ordering an attack on the Bintuzi, both as punishment for aiding the Kushans and to prevent them from bringing the affair of the exiles to the Galactic Council, and gain their support to be used against him. Not willing to let the Bintuzi be slaughtered by the forces of the Mad Emperor, Karen Sajet and her role as Fleet Command made immediate preparations to hyperspace the fleet to a region of space called the Tenhauser Gate, where the ambush was to take place. A short time later, emerging from hyperspace, the Mothership sensors did indeed find a Tidan fleet already assaulting a heavily damaged Bintuzi exchange ship. Time became of the essence. The Bintuzi would not last much longer against the onslaught of their firepower. Rushing forth, the Kushans charged headfirst into the Tidani ships, determined to protect their only friends in the galaxy since the burning of Karak. There was no time for cunning or strategy. This battle was essentially one gigantic brawl between two fleets until one emerged triumphant, which of course would be the Kushan. With the Tidan ships reduced to space debris and a moment to take stock, the Bentuzi opened communications with the mothership and Karen Sajet directly. With the intervention of her fleet in rescuing their ship, the Bentuzi felt compelled to share certain information with Karen and her people, knowledge that up to this point was forbidden, which was the lost history of the Kushan people. In the first time long, long ago, a war that spanned the galaxy brought the Kushan people to their knees. Only a united cry for mercy from the other sentients of the galaxy prevented their total extinction by their enemies, the Tidani. So instead, an alternative was found. Exile. The Tidan would take possession of Hagara and establish it as their new capital world, whereas the Kushans were forced to board sublight transport ships similar to that of the Kartoba and be sent on a one-way course to the outer rim of the galaxy. Any form of contact or aid by the other spacefaring races was strictly forbidden, and knowledge of their existence was to be systematically erased. Over the course of the long exodus, many of the ships in the convoy would fall prey to the dangers of the galaxy, while others simply fell apart due to aging technology and poor construction, and even some going their own way to find the means to their survival as a people elsewhere. Finally, one ship managed to make it to the world that was to be their new home, Karak. In time, the Kushans would forget their history, their legacy, as the histories of old became myth and legend. The only reminders of their glorious heritage being the hyperspace core and the Guidestone, which was carved from Agara's angel moon. But now, knowledge of the exile's journey was becoming known to the Galactic Council, with many of its races having prophesied the return of the Kushans. Before they parted, the Bentuzi implored Karen Sajet and her people to find their homeworld, while they summoned the Council, ostensibly to help the Kushans claim it. Perhaps buoyed by a new sense of purpose, the exiles continued their journey, but as they were moving through hyperspace, the quantum waveform generated by the Mothership Hyperspace Core began collapsing for an unknown reason forcing the Kushans to drop back into normal space, where, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, 
A Taidan fleet waited to greet them with ion cannons and mass drivers at the ready. What the Taidan fleet had done was set up a series of gravity well generators, which, as their name implied, generated a gravity well that could interrupt the hyperspace systems of ships traveling nearby and prevent their escape. But that was not all. The gravity well generators also could disable the propulsion systems of any corvette or fighter class strike craft, rendering them essentially dead in space. Fortunately, frigate classes and larger were unaffected. Knowing this, the Taidan marauders focused their attack on the smaller Kushan craft, intending to finish the job that the burning of Karak started. But even with this handicap, the Kushan warriors refused to give in to despair, and steeled themselves for another battle against overwhelming odds. And eventually, the Kushans were able to overcome the Taidani destroying their warships and the gravity well generators barring the way to their homeworld. But as the last generator faded into the space of the galactic core, the universe was set to throw the Kushans another curveball. A Taidani destroyer, a elite guard vessel named the Capella under command of one Captain Elson, was on an intercept course with the mothership. While en route, Elson was broadcasting his intention to defect to the Kushan fleet. However, his ship was under heavy fire by Taidan loyalists who were fully resolved to stop his defection. If he was to survive for much longer, he would need the help of the Kushans. Wary but willing to help the destroyer, fleet intelligence ordered the rescue of the Capella, crushing Elson's pursuers and bringing his ship into the fleet proper. Once brought aboard the mothership, a grateful Captain Elson explained to fleet command that a full-on rebellion was happening within the Taidan Empire. Discontent had been slowly brewing under the surface for centuries due to the Empire's continual downward slide into corruption and tyranny. But it was the use of the atmosphere deprivation device during the burn that finally ignited the rebellion. The use of such a forbidden technology that resulted in the near annihilation of another people was the final straw that drove many within the Empire to rebel. Through his actions, Emperor Ristu had demonstrated to the galaxy that his madness and paranoia had become too dangerous to simply ignore. If he and the Exile fleet could reach a place called the Keras Graveyard, they could find a hidden communications relay to make contact with the other rebel forces. And together, maybe they could forcibly dethrone Emperor Ristu and create a better future for both their peoples. The Keras Graveyard was the perfect place to hide such a relay, as the Taidan Navy seemingly ignored the area, possibly due to it being guarded by automated guns that attacked anything their artificial intelligence deemed to be a threat. In addition, the graveyard was home to a robotic warden nicknamed the Junkyard Dog, a heavily armored, seemingly invincible ship that would take trespassing vessels and forcibly place them elsewhere. Due to these factors, it can be assumed that there was nothing in the graveyard that would warrant an expedition, so the Empire was content to ignore it. Unfortunately, while this made the relay secure, a sizable contingent of warships would be needed to force their way past the defenses and activate the means to fully mobilize the Taidan Rebellion. When the mothership fleet entered the Keras graveyard, it did not take them long to encounter the junkyard dog, but upon some analysis, a critical weakness was discovered, a weakness that could be exploited upon thanks to the lessons learned from a previous engagement the Exiles fought in shortly after they emerged from the Garden of Kadesh. During that battle, a ghost ship used some form of control field that allowed it to take over almost any vessel that approached it. By using the data gained from this encounter, the Kushans were able to construct a mobile gravity well generator, and then proceeded to send it on a one-way course to the Junkyard Dog. When the robotic canine closed in on the seemingly helpless prey, it found itself trapped and unable to move within the generator's artificial gravity. The Kushan fleet then brought all their guns to bear on the junkyard dog. Even with its armor, it could not withstand a continuous bombardment of mass drivers and ion cannons for long. And in a surprising amount of time, the former guardian of Keros rejoined the rest of the graveyard in pieces. With the junkyard dog now destroyed, the Kushan fleet turned its attention to the automated sentry guns surrounding the relay, which quickly became easy pickings for the fleet's guns. Once the hidden comm relay was clear of hostiles, Captain Elson was able to reach the array to contact his people, and after a short amount of time had passed, 
he informed Fleet Command that the Tai Dan resistance was beginning to mobilize. The fall of the Tai Dan Empire had just begun. The next step before the Kushan fleet could move further into Imperial space was to find a way past the hyperspace inhibitor network the Tai Dani had set up to prevent intruders from approaching Hagara. These stations were so heavily shielded that they could not be detected by any form of long-range sensor technology. Fortunately, Captain Nelson, before he parted ways with the Kushan fleet, provided the location of what was considered by the Resistance to be the most vulnerable inhibitor. The plan, in the simplest terms, was to punch a hole through the network by assaulting this hyperspace inhibitor to allow for the Mothership fleet to continue their journey. Having come too far to be stopped by the hyperspace equivalent of a giant ferris wheel, the Kushans once more sallied forth to destroy yet another obstacle between them and their homeworld. While the Tai Dani had numbers and a constant stream of reinforcements from nearby hyperspace gates that were unaffected by the inhibitors, the Kushan mothership was inevitably able to add another mark to her increasingly large kill count. Now, finally, finally, the way was open for the exiles to make the last jump to the long-lost homeworld of Hagara and be reunited with the birthplace of their people. But Emperor Aristu had a plan within a plan to deal with this increasingly maddening threat to his rightful dominion over his empire. By attacking the hyperspace inhibitor, he knew where the fleet was and what vector they would use to reach Hagara. And with this knowledge, he could determine the exact point in which to interdict their hyperspace journey and spring the trap that would finally crush this troublesome fleet of exiles and prove to the galaxy the strength of his power. Forced out of hyperspace yet again, Fleet Command found themselves in a collision course with an asteroid that was hurtling towards the mothership. This headshot asteroid had engines grafted onto its surface to propel itself at a speed that would greatly expedite the matter of reaching its target. Normally, an asteroid, even one equipped with engines, would not be too much of a concern to a fleet of battle-hardened veteran warships. However, Ristu knew this and made sure to have an entire fleet of Tidan ships escort the asteroid to its intended target. Unable to escape, Fleet Command was forced to give the order to stand and fight their way through. The ensuing battle was a desperate struggle to the bitter end, with a headshot asteroid acting as a fatal yet slow-moving countdown. But eventually, Kushan Ion frigates and capital ships were able to turn their temporary nemesis into another asteroid field much like the others spread out through the void of space. The Tidani, on the other hand, perhaps not willing to face the wrath of their mad emperor, fought and died to the last. Now, there were truly no more obstacles between them and Hagara, and the Kushans eagerly began what was to be the last hyperspace jump of their exodus. But, Emperor Ristu left nothing to chance, and had another plan if the headshot asteroid failed. In the span of time it would take the Kushans to engage his forces, he would rally as much of the Taidan navy as he could to defend Hagara, where he would personally lead the defense from his own Taidan Imperial flagship. And there was more still. Now that Karen Sajet and her fleet were closing the distance on Hagara, Ristu was able to directly contact Karen, and somehow disabled her command and control systems that drove the logistics of the fleet and operations of the mothership. Thankfully emerging from hyperspace near the homeworld, the situation had suddenly went from a triumphant march home to a desperate struggle for survival. With Karen no longer operating as Fleet Command, the voice of Fleet Intelligence, Sinsk Sajet, was forced to take up the mantle of leading the fleet, a laborious task in the best of times made near impossible by the incoming Taidan forces descending upon their fleet, like ravenous predators catching the scent of a wounded prey. Wave after wave of Taidan capital ships and frigates threw themselves at the mothership, with none succeeding in breaking through the Kushan formations. But eventually, little by little, more Kushan ships fell to the continuing onslaught. No amount of grit and determination could withstand the seemingly endless strength the Taidani could bring to bear on them. And with fleet command disabled and fleet intelligence struggling to turn the battle in their favor, it seemed the homeworld war was about to end tragically just as the dream of Hagara was within the exile's grasp. But just then, Captain Elson and the fleet of the Taidan Rebellion jumped into the system and began engaging the Imperial fleets. 
and together the exiles and the rebels were able to turn the tide and break the back of the Imperial Navy. With their forces united, they quickly seized the initiative and brought their ships to bear against the last thing standing between the Kushans and their homeworld, and the rebels their freedom from tyranny. Emperor Ristu IV II. Everything that had been building up to this point in the past year, from the burning of Karak to this final battle over Higara, led to the Mad Emperor of the Taidan Empire. The Homeworld War would never end until Ristu was deposed from his rulership. In a climactic showdown, Kushan warriors and Taidani freedom fighters fought through the Emperor's elite guard and struck at the Emperor's flagship. And in a stunning display of coordination and battlefield acumen, both groups managed to destroy the flagship, killing the Emperor and ending his tyrannical reign. With Reese II dead, Karen was free from his influence and resumed her role as fleet command. But even with the Emperor dead, the Tai Dan Imperialists would not give up Higara without a fight, and the Tai Dani on the planet below would doubtless do the same. As the Kushans began to consider these notions, their longtime allies, the Ventusi, returned. But they did not come alone. Emissaries from the Galactic Council accompanied them, and with their authority, the Bentuzi declared the war to be over, and that Higara would return to the Kushans. The Homeworld War changed everything in the galactic landscape. During the course of a year-long campaign, the Taidan Empire, perhaps the largest and most powerful government in the galaxy, collapsed. In their stead, a new people would eventually arise to take their place, the Kushans. But now reunited with their long-lost homeworld, they could call themselves by their true name for the first time in countless millennia. Higarans. The homeworld war was over, but the tale of the Higarans had just begun. Thank you.